Full Color 4. Hi, this is Johnny Carson. As you know, this is usual starting time for The Tonight Show. And tonight, my guest is the New Orleans District Attorney, Mr. Jim Garrison, who is with us to discuss, as he puts it, some new and vital information concerning the Kennedy assassination. But because of the critical war situation in Vietnam, especially around Saigon, NBC, for the next 15 minutes, is going to bring you a special news program via satellite. So stay with us. We'll return in 15 minutes with our guest, Mr. Garrison. The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. NBC News presents Viet Cong Terror. The new communist campaign in Vietnam continues. Just after midnight their time, a band of Viet Cong raiders blew up a power installation and attacked two police stations in Saigon. Other small bands still roam the city. The Viet Cong are reported to be in complete control of a militant Buddhist headquarters less than a mile from the center of town. And there are reports that the National Liberation Front has formed a revolutionary council to run Saigon. At nearby Tonsonut Air Force Base, which is also American military headquarters, sporadic sniper fire continues to be heard. At Hue, the old imperial capital, 400 miles to the north, the Viet Cong is holding on to part of the town, as well as half the city of Kontum in the central highlands. Along the northern coastline, Nha Trang and Quy An have come under fresh mortar fire. And earlier today, South Vietnamese President Thu declared martial law. It all amounts to the most ambitious series of communist attacks yet mounted, spreading violence into at least 10 provincial capitals, plus American air bases and civilian installations stretching the entire length of the country. None had greater psychological impact than the assault on the American embassy in Saigon. For a late film report on Vietnam countrywide, here is NBC News correspondent Jack Perkins in Tokyo by satellite. 232 GIs killed and 900 wounded makes one of the heaviest weeks of the Vietnam War. And it is not a week. It is just over two days, the past two days, two of the worst we have known in Vietnam. We have film reports tonight from NBC News. This was the 31st of January, 1968, a day where I think that people would have been watching this report and realizing they were in history a little bit. Or perhaps that realisation, you know, wasn't quite articulated in the mind, but our perspective can often escape us in these moments as we simply gaze at the screen or watch the next video pop up on our phones, you know, watching history unfold between ad breaks. But 50 years ago, this was one of those days where the stone was thrown into the pond of history and the initial splash was quite high and made a big impact, but this was one where both the initial effects and the ones that come down the line really do seem to shake up the whole timeline. It's the infamous surprise attacks of the Tet Offensive. And as usual, these things don't often come out of a vacuum. There were reports intercepted here or there or intelligence about this or that. But as many of these history-defining events seem to go, it kind of appeared out of nowhere. The unexpected not being quite expected enough. And one insight into that failure of intelligence can be seen in some of the primary sources I've been really into lately. I've kept up using those declassified CIA documents. And the presidential briefings have been a great thing for getting the general feel of what was going on from day to day, week to week, and particularly from the point of view of the presidential office. What were they interested in or focusing on? Essentially, these documents are exactly what you'd imagine. President sits down, it's Johnson at the time we're talking about here, so he's got a cigarette. Presumably he loved Siggy, so let's imagine him with one. He gets handed this thin stack of pages, you know, around 10 or 12 or so, and it basically just has a bit of an update about Things he needs to be across, intelligence staff or an update about a situation in one country or another. Back then it even came as a kind of itemised list, like it might be uh, number one uh, in Czechoslovakia, a government movement uh, disregarding a new trade law has led to something or another party stepping up efforts to undermine the Minister of 
you know, something like that. Kind of this inside scoop that, let's say, maybe your average journalist isn't getting, but that the network of CIA spies around the world probably have a bit more insight on. Anyway, on the 29th of January, the day before the earliest explosions of Tet, North or South Vietnam weren't even top of the briefing. There was actually this situation going on in Korea, where the North had captured a US Navy vessel, the Pueblo, and there were some hostages involved and it was a bit of a hassle. When the report did come to the situation in Vietnam, which came split into North and South, North was number two on the agenda that day. And that whole paragraph or so is still redacted, folks, so apologies. But I think it's safe to assume that whatever was written there, it, well, it didn't say massive coordinated attack incoming. I, I, I highly doubt that. So number three on the agenda, that was the situation in South Vietnam. It was very short, just three sentences with one of them redacted. And it says... Enemy military activity has not been reduced significantly since the beginning of the Viet Cong announced ceasefire period three days ago. It notes some of the big North Vietnamese army battalions are still engaged in preparation for some of the large-scale battles that were going on in some of the outlying areas. So what that part of the briefing is essentially saying is there's not that much going on, nothing really out of the ordinary. And although there was still some activity here and there, it was more or less the same as usual, even though this was during a kind of tacitly agreed upon uh, time of year where the communists usually backed off from fighting. It was the Tet holiday season, which is the most important Vietnamese holiday, uh, the significance very well encapsulated in a line from Stanley Kubrick's Vietnam War movie, Full Metal Jacket, which is about this time. And the guy says, Tet is like the 4th of July, Christmas, and New Year's all rolled into one. So we've got the president reading this briefing on the 29th of January. Or maybe it's being read to him. And maybe for the first time in a while, he wasn't too fussed about the situation, which had been, you know, obviously a, a sore spot throughout his whole presidency, basically. As far as he is being told by his advisors and, you know, generals... The U.S. is in a pretty good position. Their pacification programs out in the countryside and their search-and-destroy missions too, they've been dismantling the rural networks of Viet Cong activity and therefore the administration of the countryside in South Vietnam was, you know, being clawed back from the communists. Johnson and his generals might have also been buoyed by events transpiring outside of Vietnam. As we saw in the last episode, there was... Maybe even some movement going on at this point that will address some of the problem areas over the border in Cambodia. Maybe he'll be able to get at these sanctuary areas and parts of the Ho Chi Minh Trail that were providing all of this support for the Viet Cong in the South. And to make them all even more comfortable, the knowledge that North Vietnam was being bombed all the time, surely that was making the lives difficult up there too. Maybe... Soon, the North would have to come to the negotiating table. Well, the next day, the 30th of January, the presidential briefing reads a little differently. It kind of blows some of that confidence about the war out of the water. Remember, the briefing is coming from CIA intelligence, which is being hastily gathered about a rapidly developing situation. And the report from South Vietnam is even marked as of 5.30am. And it says, quote, Sharp fighting in the cities of Pleiku, Kontum, Da Nang, Na Trang. Information is still sketchy on what is happening around the other cities and bases hit by the well-coordinated and unprecedented communist offensive. Designed for maximum psychological impact, the communists concentrated on showing they could shoot their way into major populated areas, particularly provincial capitals. End quote. The most eye-catching among the hundreds of attacks that would occur in this 24-hour news cycle was at the U.S. Embassy compound in Saigon. The New York Times is running articles that morning with headlines like, Johnson receives flow of reports. He meets with advisors on Saigon Raid. And Raiders wiped out after six hours. Viet Cong widen attack on cities. Or 
Foe invades U.S. Saigon Embassy. U.S. aid in Embassy Villa kills Gorilla with a pistol. And it was the next nightly news when the NBC special report interrupting Johnny Carson's Tonight Show that we played just a moment ago came on, running its coverage of what was unfolding in South Vietnam and perhaps starting to shape the opinion about how the war was going. Perhaps the whole view of the situation was starting to beg a kind of subconscious incongruence that maybe the family sat down for dinner in America hadn't experienced before. These are American combat military police and troops from the 101st Airborne Division, half a block from the U.S. Embassy. Viet Cong snipers and suicide commandos were holed up inside the embassy compound and firing from surrounding buildings. The Americans had to move cautiously. About 15 Viet Cong commandos were now on the embassy grounds. They had rushed in under a Viet Cong mortar and rocket attack that scored at least two hits on the new $3 million eight-story building. It was opened two and a half months ago. They show footage of armed men making their way down the streets under fire. Every five seconds of the report is punctuated by the sound of gunfire. Some of the enemy commandos were killed trying to regroup near the front door of the embassy. Now CIA men and MPs have gone into the embassy and are trying to get the snipers out by themselves. footage of the dead and dying. The reporter questions the preparedness, he emphasizes the shock and awe, and we literally have an over-the-shoulder view peeking out behind the concrete as Troops shoot off dozens of rounds into windows at hidden figures. We see the bloodied corpse of a Viet Cong commando in plain clothes laid out on the ultra-green grass of a decoratively landscaped area. And as the cameraman zooms out from that focus to show a military policeman crouched behind a column just metres away, we realise we're inside of a battle. The attack on the embassy and the close quarters coverage of this symbol of the US presence in South Vietnam being secured after a six-hour raid that had begun at 3 a.m. in the morning was stunning to see. It still is. It was followed by reports from other journalists at other areas under attack. The airport, the radio station. All the while, constant bursts of machine gun fire and explosions in the background. It drowns out much of what the reporters are saying. In print, some journalists remarked on the Viet Cong still being able to find thousands of men that were not just ready to engage in guerrilla war, but these were suicide missions. One said that these attacks had demolished the myth that the Allies are in military control of South Vietnam. And this particular piece of coverage, this NBC special report, well, it wrapped up with uh, similar sentiments. Even the American military must grudgingly admire what the Viet Cong were able to do and what they achieved. The perfectly timed attacks are going to be remembered a lot longer than the less dramatic but hard-fought American victories of late. Pentagon officials believe the Viet Cong paid dearly for their acts of rampant terrorism, but surely the communist leaders must feel they were worth it. They do not appear to be final acts of desperation. The U.S. military may now have to rethink basic tactical and strategic concepts in Vietnam. Troops may have to be redeployed. The Americans are painfully weak in many important areas, particularly in the Central Highlands. The communists may not be winning the war, as the Pentagon claims, but they don't seem to be losing it either. Robert Gorelsky, NBC News, Washington. Is there water in your hairspray? There shouldn't be. Water takes the shape out of your hairdo. You need the water-free hairspray. Self-styling adorn. 
Adorn's water-free formula puts shape into your hair and keeps it there. Actually holds up to twice as long. So put shape into your hairdo and keep it there with the water-free hairspray, self-styling Adorn. So at the end of the last episode, we briefly covered the planning of this offensive and the kind of stalemate that had led to US generals thinking that they had the upper hand in the war and the NLF and the North thinking they too were in a pretty good position. But it actually wasn't until just two weeks prior to the offensive that the Vietnamese Workers' Party officially sanctioned the offensive at a communist conference. The resolution that they present is a very handy source in that it gives us an insight into what they hoped the offensive would achieve and the importance that it was imbued with. For instance, it begins with references to the movement in South Vietnam presenting like revolutionary conditions that could echo the August Revolution in 1945, the subsequent war against the French, and the, quote, glorious victory at Dien Bien Phu. The resolution states that, quote, the revolution in South Vietnam presents a new stage in the Vietnamese people's national democratic revolutionary movement, led by the labouring class. It is an integral part of the high tide of world revolution that is currently in an offensive posture, systematically pushing back and crushing individual imperialist forces in order to gradually and completely eliminate all imperialist positions throughout the world. End quote. They go on to characterise the American imperialists being at a strategic dead end. And while they acknowledge that the pacification programs of the US military and the search and destroy programs have had some negative effects on their goals, they say that this combination of attempts to disrupt the communist control of the South cannot keep going. Interestingly, they also point out the political and economic problems associated with the ongoing war, and quote, the strategic position of the Americans is steadily weakening, not only in South Vietnam, and domestically within the US, but even on the world stage, and they have never been as isolated as they are at present, end quote. But now we actually get to what they are planning to do. That's, that's included in the resolution. So the main objective was not really to just cause some chaos and, you know, give the impression that the Viet Cong are still in the fight. You know, these are the initial uh, conclusions that the CIA come to. It's similarly the impression that some of the reporters that we heard were giving as well. But it really wasn't just a psychological play it wasn't a distraction from a major Dien Bien Phu-esque battle at Khe San. No, the communists genuinely planned to begin a popular uprising that would topple the South Vietnamese regime and make the US essentially have to abandon their ally and bow out of the war at the negotiation table. In the resolution, the communists claim that, quote, the masses of the population in the cities and in areas of South Vietnam temporarily under enemy control, have many times risen up in many different forms of insurrection. Millions of the masses are seething with revolutionary spirit and are ready to rise up, prepared to sacrifice everything for the causes of independence, freedom, peace, prosperity, and land. This situation allows us to move the revolutionary war of the people in South Vietnam into a new era, the era of offensives and uprising to secure decisive victory. End quote. Now, the key takeaway from that particular section is their reading of the situation, vis-à-vis -vis the degree to which the urban populations in these various cities and towns will be essentially unleashed once these uprisings occur. They're supposedly seething with revolutionary spirit. So the plan was to have this stunning series of attacks with NLF troops disguised as ordinary peasants or South Vietnamese soldiers. There were North Vietnamese troops in some of the attacks. And they've moved into the cities and they've stockpiled and secretly prepared weapons. And they're using their intimate knowledge of these areas 
And they, they're planning on exactly who to assassinate once the offensives begin. You know, we see them take out the radio station. Like, this is a very well-coordinated move. And the plan was to, in one fell swoop, really, establish a revolutionary government in all of these towns and cities, and even in Saigon, and eliminate the existing structure. So, hypothetically, imagine secretly setting yourself up in a town, and then one day you kill the mayor, the chief of police, the city council, you, know, you and some other well-prepared people. You know, you just take out that whole structure of power, and you immediately replace that structure with a revolutionary one that was picked out ahead of time, and you are sort of assuming that you're going to be able to do this with the support of all of the inhabitants of the town, or at least the majority of them. They're essentially going to not only cheer you on, but help out logistically, maybe even pick up arms themselves and join you to topple the local government. So it's basically that plan on a massive scale up and down South Vietnam. They planned on causing the collapse of the Saigon government. The communists had staged a few pre-Tet attacks in rural areas in order to sort of disperse and spread American and South Vietnamese troops around. But remember, it is the holidays as well, and a lot of people are just, you know, on holidays. So they've been setting up a bit of a distraction, as we mentioned, at Khe as well. This is... This is one of, if not the, you know, big traditional kind of battle, and it does have a similar sort of mythology around it, as Dien Bien Phu did. American generals were kind of thinking that that maybe Jap was going to try and, you know, redo that that stunning victory from from the first Indochina War. So. There, there is some movement around that, so again, a bit of a distraction up there from what's going on, but, but no one really expects what's going to happen. There were scattered pieces of intelligence and indications of something that was widespread, but perhaps due to the difficulty of judging what was just energetic propaganda and just how, you know, how equipped an offensive like this could be, not to mention the scale and surprise. You, you know, US officials would later claim that they kind of thought something might happen, but they couldn't really even be sure where. And it all finally began in the very early morning hours of the 30th of January. And as we heard in those various reports in the intro, within only a matter of hours, the communists had struck five of the six major cities in South Vietnam. 36 of 44 provincial capitals and 64 district capitals. Okay, so throughout this discussion of the Tet Offensive, where, again, this is not a military history show, we're not really going to be going too much into the the, the detail here, but I, I do want to sort of keep the story going with Saigon because it is, is it would sort of, yeah, we had the intro there with with those, uh, those news clips and that discussion there. So we'll go from there, but I just want to keep in mind, you know, or rather ask you to keep in mind the different perspectives that were experiencing this. Yes, there were the American troops stationed there, there were the administrators, there were the generals, and then there were the people back in the US looking on via TV or through reports in the papers. And there were the South Vietnamese civilians and army who had presumed their cities were removed from the fighting out in the countryside. There were the northern Vietnamese generals and officials and army, and there was the Viet Cong in the south who had to do most of the fighting against their own people. Remember, this is, this is a civil war first and foremost. It just has other very interested parties contributing significantly to the outcome and putting their skin in the game. So back to this stunning attack on Saigon, which will produce all of this fighting in the streets and have essentially kinds of suicide units of Viet Cong being thrown into some of these attacks when you think about what they're running up against. Like, it really is kind of... They knew what they were doing. And this is right in the capital. And it's 
surrounds and on American bases in the city and the surrounding areas too. Major bases. Now, General Hoang Kong Tan was a Viet Cong sub-regional commander during the offensive on Saigon. And he wrote a memoir about his experiences in the 90s. And it, it has a really great perspective um, from, from you know, the people that fought in it on, on that side. I'll quote various parts of the memoir presented in Edward Miller's collection of primary sources on the Vietnam War, beginning with how Tan experienced the build-up to the offensive on Saigon. Quote, With respect to the organisation and preparation of our military forces, a number of the reinforcement units promised to the sub-region by higher authorities had still not arrived, and other units were under strength in terms of both troops and weapons. Almost all of our district local troops and village guerrillas were called up and assigned to our main force battalions on an urgent basis to strengthen them. In addition, we also had to mobilise hundreds of civilian youths into our armed forces. This left the rural areas virtually devoid of military forces. And I'll skip ahead slightly. He says there were some organisational issues to get over, but there was a tremendous enthusiasm. An enthusiasm based on the fact that this time, victory had been assured. And he goes on to explain that, the reasons why they were so confident. Quote, Our national level leadership, our superiors, had made careful calculations for this offensive. Certainly they would only have made this decision if it were certain we could win. Because this was a major decision. It was not just one single battle to be fought in just one locality. Okay, and again, skipping slightly ahead, we've got his description once the offensive had begun. Quote, Events during that first day of fighting in Saigon were completely different from what we had expected. The spearhead battalions were not able to advance rapidly because they carried only small, light weapons and had little ammunition, while enemy forces were numerous and used the thick building walls and the tangle of streets and alleys in the cities to put up a ferocious resistance. The civilian population had a very good attitude towards our troops when they encountered our men, but we never saw any large demonstrations erupt in the city. Only a small number of youths and students made contact with our troops, and these groups did not launch the kind of struggle demonstrations we had seen them conduct in the past. This meant we had to conduct a purely military struggle. We were not playing a supporting role for an uprising of the masses as we had thought. On the second day of the offensive, there were no major changes, either militarily or politically, in the overall situation. The rate of advance of our spearhead battalions began to slow. The enemy launched powerful counterattacks in a number of locations. End quote. So let's pause on his sort of memoir for a bit, but what had started with such an experience of shock and awe, I mean, it can't get too much more extreme than 19 Viet Cong blowing a hole in the wall surrounding the US embassy and, you know, waging a six-hour firefight on the grounds and in the offices. They attack the airport, the presidential palace, they blow up the national radio station. But stunning as the initial wave that broke the sea wall was... As we're seeing here, there was no subsequent flow of water in that would have submerged everything and, and washed everything away. For instance, this attack on the embassy, while shocking, and the footage of this being shown on the news later that night, it's crazy to watch, but while the symbolism of the Viet Cong commandos storming in, opening fire on the Marines guarding the gate and firing some rockets at a building which caused the US national seal to fall off the wall. You know, they wounded one marine and they, they killed another and they scared all of the people in there. But they did not inflict heavy casualties. And the hours long firefight between them and these military police and the CIA men, well it was lacking much purpose or plan. The commandos exchanged fire from behind some flower beds or within a couple of the surrounding offices. And when you go back and look at the footage, 
the, the footage as it's occurring, it does have a strange quality of not looking very serious if you know what's going on. News cameras capturing the relatively relaxed exchange of a cigarette lighter between two prone soldiers, is that because they are not really too worried? Or is it because, you know, in the heat of the battle, this is a, an emotionally scarring event where, you know, one guy here may have, have this. It depends the sort of valence you give that. You know, the footage of the CIA man in a short, summery-looking shirt sort of blindly poking a gun over a wall into a window and unloading a whole clip, in some ways, it does speak to a lack of real threat. The embassy was declared secure at 9.15. The raid had penetrated the compound of the embassy. Like, this is a, it's a large area. But they didn't get into the embassy itself. Uh, Captain Jack Speedy, who had been tasked with clearing the compound, stated that, quote, The bodies of the communist dead were not even cold when a Mongolian horde of the press burst into the compound. My most pressing problem became newsmen. End quote. That's just a little, you know, another little nod to, to how much of a, a role the media will play in the Tet Offensive. As the days went on, when ammunition starts running out and when positions of snipers and mortars get overrun, when the students and masses had still not appeared and had not produced the seething revolutionary spirit that was apparently there, well then these Viet Cong troops and guerrillas need to start withdrawing. Now, Tan, whose memoir we were reading before, he lost his 17-year-old son in these retreats. And he spends a paragraph or so describing the heartbreak that that caused him. And he then describes the second wave of these attacks that occurred in May. So months later, there was another kind of, it was like a mini Tet offensive that fared even worse because it lacked the element of surprise. Quote, The fighting was extremely violent but our troops could not penetrate any deeper than they had during the first offensive, and in places didn't even get as far as they had the first time. All the fighting was done in the streets because our forces were unable to reach and penetrate any enemy military or political targets. Even now, every time I recall these events, my mind is still filled with thoughts and confusion, with strategic policy, and from a purely military standpoint, it would have been impossible to reach the decision to attack and seize control of Saigon with the tactics and forces that were actually employed without the military attack being coordinated with a general uprising. But then, why did the political part of the offensive never materialise? What were the conditions among the masses and the students in Saigon that led our people to the conclusion that millions of them were boiling over with revolutionary zeal and were prepared to sacrifice everything for the cause of independence and freedom. End quote. So audacious, if that is the right word, as it was, there was certainly a lack of, perhaps, the final touches on this plan. I mean, even the date of the offensive was a little confusing. You might have noticed that I've switched the date of the initial attack sometimes. Sources will say attack started here on the 30th and over there the 31st. That was because the lunar calendar had been changed in North Vietnam that year, and therefore the first day of Tet would actually be one day earlier than the date used on the old calendar. This meant that some of the cities and provincial capitals and American bases were attacked in this coordinated surprise a full day earlier than the others. There were other similarly disjointed examples. A squad in Saigon tasked with breaking into a prison and freeing the inmates failed because their guides had been killed by police. One onlooker remembered seeing a single Viet Cong commando sat on the street inconsolable because he had lost his fellow attackers in the mazy streets of the unfamiliar city of Saigon like a child lost in a shopping centre. At one South Vietnamese army base, Viet Cong conspirators had promised that a mutiny would materialise. It did not. 
the commandos who stormed the base were all killed or captured. Even the raid on the US embassy compound was supposed to be embarked upon by twice as many Viet Cong, but half simply didn't turn up. In some other cases, however, the plan was executed with lethal precision. Part of the overall plan of the offensive involved Viet Cong assassination squads, led by local guides, to the homes of those who had been put on lists of targets. Generally, lower military figures and bureaucrats, people like that. One North Vietnamese spy later recalled, quote, The armed scouts of our security network did a number of excellent jobs in assassinating traitors, end quote. And this is from the accompanying book to the Ken Burns Vietnam documentary, quote, A taxi driver remembered that when the guerrillas came to his street, they decapitated three people and left their bodies and heads lying at a coffee shop. I don't know what crimes these people committed. I only saw the Viet Cong throw their corpses in the street and forbid anyone's passing that place. End quote. Another scene of brutality would also occur in Saigon in this earliest part of the offensive. However, this one would be seen around the world. A Viet Cong prisoner, who had supposedly been a member of these assassination squads, was hastily executed at point-blank range with a pistol by Brigadier General Nguyen Nhoc Lon, the head of the South Vietnamese National Police. The moment was caught on camera by an Associated Press photographer and by an NBC film crew. The photographer, Eddie Adams, had presumed the prisoner was just going to be threatened, something he had seen plenty of times before, and it was almost pure chance that he clicked the shutter of his camera at the precise moment that Nhoc Lone pulled the trigger on the pistol. You can see in the photo the release of energy that will soon be carrying a bullet into the side of the man's head, as a kind of indentation was created in the ripples of the skin on his temple and upper cheek, as well as the terrified expression on his face. Nhoc Lon said, in English, to the photographer afterwards, as blood poured upwards out of the man's skull, that he killed many of my men, and many of your people. And then he walked away. While this was essentially a war crime, the picture of this event took on a whole life of its own in the minds of anyone who saw it. Much like the raid on the embassy, the cameras could show something without, perhaps, the entirety of the context. And this was going to have a great influence on the perception of the war in Vietnam, in America, and the rest of the world. But beating back this offensive also meant having to utilise massive amounts of firepower in some areas. In the city of Ben Tre, perhaps close to 50% of the entire city's dwellings were destroyed by aerial bombardment and artillery fire in order to crush the Viet Cong regiment that had outnumbered the Americans stationed there. One journalist wrote that it seemed that more and more people were coming around to the idea that the country could never be won, only destroyed. Back in Saigon, it ended up taking 10 days to quell the last remnants of the forces who had embarked on the offensive. And I'll quote uh, the the same book I did before the the accompaniment to the documentary series uh, on this part of the situation in Saigon. Quote, eventually... Surviving NLF fighters were cornered in and around a racetrack in Kolon, the western neighbourhood populated largely by poor Chinese. Residents were ordered from their homes, which created a free fire zone, so that the last remaining guerrillas could be blasted from their hiding places. Much of the area was burned or blown apart, but the threat was finally lifted. End quote. To set your hair super straight, get Dippity Do and use your head like a super roller. See? Dippity Do it. Comb through it. Then wrap it and clip it. You get a super set with Dippity Do. Cause Dippity Do's super hold sets it straight, keeps it straight. Remember, to get it super straight, use your head and Dippity Do. Dippity Do. So while the initial surprise 
you know, due to the failure of military intelligence to perceive the massive offensive, meant that there were a few days of chaos and losses and confusion for the US and South Vietnamese. It didn't produce a decisive breakthrough. It was mostly beaten back within days in some areas, weeks in others. And the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese army suffered massively. Around 50,000 deaths over the first two months or so that the attacks took place and were counted. While it was only around 3,400 US and South Vietnamese killed or wounded. Not bad numbers for the non-communist side. And you can imagine that there was actually some confidence on the back of this. Like, surely the communist side must be extremely weakened after that. And while those initial attacks had been pretty hectic, the wider goal, the most important goal, the Tet Offensive was supposed to usher in a widespread popular uprising. And as we've heard Tan complain, you know, why did they think that was going to happen? What, what evidence did they have? Because it definitely didn't happen. As Mark Atwood Lawrence says in his History of the Vietnam War, the cities had been the revolutionary's weak spot for half a century, and little had changed by 1968. Now we will sort of come back and, and summarise Tet and what it all meant, but now that we've seen what happened in Saigon and got the general idea of how the offensive started, I want to look at what happened in Vietnam's third largest city much closer to the 17th parallel, the old capital of Wei. This was where the attackers did manage to hold their ground much longer. And we will see an example of what might have happened if these attacks across the country could have been sustained in the same way that they were there. Wei, although it will still carry a heavy casualty count for the communists, will become one of, if not the success of the Tet offensive. Wei is an old, important city for Vietnamese history. If you, my dear listener, can recall, we actually spoke about this city way, yeah, way back in the first season, episode like five, Cambodia after Angkor part two. That was another episode that sort of had to jump across the border there to Vietnam to fill in some important details that will actually affect the rest of the region. And it had a bit to do with the early visits of the French, actually, and a missionary sort of befriending an escaped Vietnamese prince and eventually supporting him back to take the throne. Cracking episode, if I don't say so myself. In any case, that was around the early 1800s, when Vietnam was kind of unified under one ruler by that young prince who took the royal name Gia Long, and he picked this city, which sits right near the centre of Vietnam, as the new capital. So what he did next was essentially build a kind of uh, citadel based on the forbidden city in Beijing. It sits right on the Perfume River, a uh, river that runs kind of diagonally into the east, uh, northeast, dividing the whole city in half. And this citadel is basically, you know, a high stone-walled, set of squares with moats around and bridges with a palace in the middle and lots of buildings and you know walled off areas around it's more or less a fortress in the 20th century the palace within the citadel had become more ceremonial than anything else after the last emperor of bao dai abdicated at the end of the second world war but the city itself thrived and by the 60s Wei was the third most populated city in Vietnam, with around 150,000 inhabitants, and the urban area spread out far more than just the central walled citadel on the river. Uh, around two-thirds of the population still lived in and around that fortress, the citadel, with the palace in the centre. This was known as the Old City. But the rest lived south of the river in the so-called New City. Now, the other thing about Wei is that due to its centralness, it's very close to the 17th parallel, dividing north and south, and therefore much closer to the North Vietnamese army. So how did the Tet Offensive play out in this old, beautiful, major city? 
Well, much like the rest of the coordinated attacks across South Vietnam, it began in the very early hours of the morning, and as we said, due to the proximity of the city to North Vietnam, many thousands of the NVA, the Army of North Vietnam, who were supporting the Viet Cong guerrillas, the, the liberation front of the South, they were encamped in forests and hills surrounding the city, uh, very, very well prepared. There were also those members of the National Liberation Front that had either laid dormant in the city itself, living sort of double lives, or those that had left for, you know, the, the jungles, uh, the, the outland areas in the years leading up to this to join the guerrilla forces. They were prepared. They had food, weapons, intelligence, and the backing of a massive army, as opposed to, say, some of the attacks launched in Saigon. The residents of Hue recalled waking up to the sights of Viet Cong and regular NVA troops creeping up through the city, through their backyards and the streets, up through to the citadel across the Perfume River. When the government troops, both South Vietnamese and the, the United States uh, troops, were alerted to this, they, you know, they dropped flares from airplanes overhead, giving the thousands of combatants distinct shadows as they continued their approach. And the fighting breaks out, obviously, and uh, people remembered seeing the tracer rounds of each side. So it's sort of the bright green and the, the bright red, almost like the rival colours of the, the lasers in Star Wars or something like that. The NVA and the Viet Cong encountered little resistance in that first morning, and their surprise tactics and their vast numbers secured much of the city, mainly occupying uh, the western side, but they did capture the citadel, this walled fortress, and the many stockpiles of weapons and ammunition that fleeing South Vietnamese armed personnel left behind. Now, there were a few pockets of US troops and South Vietnamese armed forces uh, sort of in the sort of southern part of the city and around to the northeast. Now, the uh, Liberation Forces, as I guess they were uh, considering themselves, were able to release many uh, Viet Cong uh, from the prisons in the city, and the northern, you know, the, you know, the bulk of this, uh, the, the northern army that was there were able to secure positions that meant they could block and uh, counter attacks in various choke points on uh, streets or bridges that led to uh, you know, their, their main defensive positions. I'll quote Max Hastings' History of the Vietnam War to just give you an impression of this earliest part of the, you know, the battle, um, uh, just to sort of set up what, what will happen next. Quote, All that day, the 31st of January, Fighting ebbed and flowed around Ivan Command Post and the American compound, with communist mortar bombs and 122mm rockets incoming. At one stage, the communist troops broke into the southerners' perimeter. They were expelled only after the defenders called down artillery on their own bunkers. The South Vietnamese position continued to hold out through the days that followed. Though the communists established their headquarters in the throne room of the nearby Palace of Perfect Peace, and Cadre toured the city in captured jeeps, detaining people of all ages and to both sexes who were deemed tainted by association with the regime of Americans. End quote. A different book on the subject, actually, this one is exclusively about the Battle of Wei by Mark. Bowden, the guy that wrote the book that Black Hawk Down is based on. Uh, it's a very thorough account if you are interested in more of the military history side of, side of this. Anyway, he characterizes the 31st, you know, the first day of the attack as, quote, The city is stormed and taken. At the American base in Fubai, eight miles south, commanders with no sense of what has happened dispatch two companies of marines, just over 300 men, against 10,000 enemy troops. The battle begins. End quote. So between those two descriptions, you get a bit of an idea of the very first stages of the battle. Major areas of the city, including a defensive uh, area in the middle, are taken by storm and set up in a defensive posture by the communists. They're also able to begin administrative command of the city 
in a way that the other attacks uh, of Tet, while they were hoped for, like they hoped to be able to do this kind of thing, never really eventuated. So almost overnight, large areas of Wei become a communist city with a lot of non-communist inhabitants. And the communists replace the republican flag that flew over the top of the citadel with their revolutionary one for all to see. And it becomes the task of the Americans and the South Vietnamese army to take that city back. And what Bowdoin alludes to, in addition to that, is that these attempts will be somewhat ignorant, somewhat naive, particularly to begin with. And the fighting that the Americans will face will be particularly brutal, and unlike much of what the rest of the war has been like. This will be about four weeks, essentially, of you know horrific house-to-house combat, full-on urban warfare, the worst of the Vietnam War, easily. But remember, this is about four years into the war already, and the government, you know, like the American troops, the, the Vietnamese troops they're training... They've been, uh, you know, trained predominantly for the, you know, the search and destroy missions and the fighting out in the jungles and the paddies and the villages. This is in the streets. This is, you know, tanks rolling down a street. This is, this is an army against an army. This is snipers in buildings and, and you know, taking bridges under fire. It's clearing houses. Uh, again, I'll defer to the military historians on this one. But Hastings summarises the Battle of Wei as such. Quote, The running theme of the battle that persisted through February, destroying half the former capital and killing thousands of civilians, was that the communists fought doggedly to hold the ground they had seized during the first day and night, while American and South Vietnamese forces disposed them only with agonising sluggishness. And skipping slightly ahead, he continues. Again and again, senior officers issued unrealistic orders, such as those to 1st Marines Lieutenant Colonel Ernie Cheatham from his regimental commander on Saturday the 3rd of February. When he said, I want you to attack through the city and clean the NVA out. End quote. So, in terms of, you know... As far as orders go, that sounds a little bit like when you're watching a football game and the kind of expertise you're hearing from the stands around you about how your team should go about winning. Well, that sounded like the equivalent of just saying, go and score a goal. So there seems to be a lot of that in this battle. A mix of the unfamiliarity of the actual style of fighting, as well as a distance from the reality of what the situation called for, and an ignorance on behalf of the leadership about just what was happening. That being said, there was at least an understanding of the cultural importance of the city. So airstrikes and artillery were not used in a way that could damage the historical buildings like the Citadel. For the first 10 days or so, until the reality of what was going to be necessary sunk in. As the battle rages on into mid-February, more and more of the city was turned to rubble. On the fifth day of the battle for Quay, the Marines moved out from the fortified army compound that had stood the original attack and advanced into the empty, abandoned buildings of what was Quay University. Quay, the ancient imperial city. It is to Vietnamese what old Boston is to Americans, where many of its country's leaders are born or educated where many returned to celebrate Tet a week ago when the fighting began, where many remain hidden in the unknown interior of the resistance. Colonel Cheatham, uh, what's the objective and your, what are your men about to do? Well, I've, I've got two companies here that are just about to clear the next two blocks up. Uh, I've got one company in this, in this big building here that I guess is the end of the Way University, and they are going to start firing in support of Foxtrot Company, which will be going up this road here on the left and attempt to take a couple large wall buildings that are on up about five or 600 meters. What kind of fighting is it going to be? It's house to house and from room to room. Nope. Kind of inch by inch. That's, that's exactly what it is. Had you ever expected to experience this kind of street fighting in Vietnam? No, I didn't, and this is my first crack at uh, street fighting. 
I think this is the first time the Marine Corps has been street fighting since Seoul in 1950. And a little bit in Santa Domingo. And a little bit there, yes, right. What's going to happen to civilians who might get caught in there? Well, we're hoping that we don't run into any, any civilians in there right now. If they are, I'm pretty sure there are civilians that are the, what we would consider the bad guys right now. We have certain areas in here that we have blocked off that we know there are friendly civilians and we aren't going to take those under fire. The others? The others, if there's somebody in there right now, they're Charlie as far as we're concerned. Bedtime and brush your teeth. I don't like those toothpaste you get. Let's play Riddles. Just one. What's red, white, and new? What? New Colgate toothpaste. Go brush. Colgate, the flavor is fresher than ever. It's new, it's improved. Even more important is all the clinical research on anti-cavity Colgate. In test after test, the results confirm Colgate unsurpassed in reducing new cavities when compared to the best known fluoride. Get anti-cavity Colgate. There is a great book, a memoir, written in 1969 called Morning Headband for Way by Nya Ka, as in M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. And she gives a great insight into what this looked like from the civilian perspective. I was struck by the density of her writing about just the sounds and the smells of the early days. It was always about the sounds of machine gun fire in the background, the mortar explosions, and then eventually the deeper explosions as the Americans introduced heavier and heavier firepower. But as the electricity failed, as the water stopped running, as the civilians lurched from one attempted exit of the city and then had to return to safe areas and then were pushed into others, the existence of life in Wei was constantly punctuated by death. She recounts seeing dead bodies of both sides of the conflict in the streets from day one, and in various hiding places having to confront both NVA and Viet Cong who were looking to secure their positions and establish their control, and later Americans and South Vietnamese doing the same thing. But amongst this, you know, just witnessing this urban warfare on a scale that's rarely been seen, as we alluded to, there was the control of large parts of the city by the communists. And what this meant for the people under their control is, is quite interesting. She recalls a blacksmith, who she remembers more as a town drunk prior to the Tet Offensive. But now, he was carrying a gun and walking around from house to house. I'll quote her here. When he meets someone, he is adorned with a big smile and brags. Compatriots, calm down! Fellow villagers, calm down! In a few days, the venerable Ho Chi Minh will come here, and then we will have a merry party to everybody's heart's content. Or he would also say, For sure you didn't know about me, did you? I've been following the Liberation Army for a long time. I have been underground and conducting guerrilla activities. End quote. She worries about what this will mean, to have this person who'd been wearing a mask in their community, now suddenly in a position like this. Similarly, she speaks of an old man, a beggar, who usually would sit in front of shops, who was now walking around, absolutely ecstatic, yelling, Listen, the Liberation Army is here. I'm so happy. I tell you all seriously. None of you has done anything here that I don't know all about. And her reaction was to feel very threatened, that everyone around her felt that they had been judged this whole time and were worried about what might happen next. So what's so sort of hard to wrap your mind around this part of uh, the, the Battle of Way is that it wasn't just, you know, the urban warfare and and the, the counterattacks and, and everything that goes along with that, but it's the people that sort of have to live their lives around that in this city. And for some of those people, it means escaping a sort of gunfire for over multiple days and running from this place to this place. And in some other places, it means being in quite close proximity to essentially a new ruling administration. 
and you've they've they've just secured a city with thousands of troops and insurgents and Nya Ka's memoir gives us an insight into what it looked like in those first few days and weeks as as this control was wrestled from one party and given to another she speaks about liberation uh, feel free to put that in scare quotes Liberation soldiers going from house to house, requisitioning young men and women to cook rice for them or to help them carry guns and ammunition, sometimes then forced into training sessions and, in fact, having to take up arms. Many people just keep hiding in their houses. As you'd imagine, they're constantly told by the Viet Cong or northern soldiers that there's nothing to worry about, that we are your friends. And they say the Liberation Army has already occupied... Way. Now we're trying to hold it to restore order. We're waiting until the fighting is finished in the provinces and then there will be peace. And soon the citizens are without much outside information to even know if that's true or not, as their radios are confiscated one by one. She says by the third day, amongst those mourning for those that had died, the incense being burnt for them and the food that had been prepared for Tet now being devoured by the Liberation cadres. It was then that their armies were organised to be concentrated in certain places in preparation for inevitable counterattacks. However, study sessions are organised across the city, and those previously hidden revolutionaries, often surprising many of the locals, appear now to lead a given part of the city under their control. These sessions involve the expected propagandizing and appeals for the population to join the revolutionary cause. But as we will see, they also begin to serve a different function. I'll quote her memoir again here, Morning Headband for Bway. Quote, On the afternoon of the third day of Tet, there are several areas that have witnessed the scenes of punishment of the guilty. A number of people in the hamlet have been arrested and condemned as followers of the armies of the Americans and their puppets. They are brought into a school, and young people, both male and female, are gathered in groups there. The familiar faces are of people who had been assigned to live in areas occupied by their enemies, and they are now authorised to judge the accused people. Verdicts are reached in a hurry. Many sentenced people are led away, Then immediately, in the afternoon of the same day, rumours spread that those people have been executed. No one has regained composure yet from the night of the first day of Tet, when guns exploded horribly, and in the morning, people opened their eyes to see plenty of blood and dead bodies. They thus now start to be afraid because of the Liberation Army's search, arrest, hold a trial operations. Even though the communists outwardly appear to be very kind to the inhabitants, At the same time, they launch arrests and trials. Schools, preschool, establishments, pagodas, churches, any other places of worship, they are all turned into locations for assemblies and for their people's courts. End quote. So what is being described here is, to me, another sad example of, well, I suppose, this is the grim reality of war, but... It's also the grim reality of an ideological position being put into practice. But it seems hurriedly enforced in this circumstance. I mean, if you cast your mind back to the episodes on the first Indochina war, there were occurrences like this. But similarly, we also saw it in the collectivization programs that Ho Chi Minh had initiated in the mid to late 1950s, once the North had begun to cleanse itself of the, well, in their eyes, how would they put it, reactionary elements that had been left behind by the French administration. Nyaka speaks about those being arrested who had been condemned as followers of the American army and its puppets. And this was a very broad brush that could be used to paint a great number of people. But as we saw in Saigon, there were these lists created ahead of time of people to target. But it does remind me of what had happened before in essentially all the other stories that we've been winding together. Soviet and Chinese examples, for instance, even the French Revolution, when these liberating forces are tasked with initiating the society they need to. There is a mix of vengeance, but there is 
a delineation of class and association which, depending on the circumstance, can and will mean a hasty death sentence. And we will certainly see this again with what is to come in Cambodia. But I'll just relay another part of her memoir here about these early assemblies and people's courts and the process of justice in this liberation of Wei. Quote, By the afternoon of the second day, the atmosphere of elation among the liberation comrades is losing its exuberance. After a tailor, suspected of being a liaison for the American puppets, is killed and his corpse is tossed out for display at the T-junction, and after two young people in a small shelter are shot on mere accusations of evading the Liberation Army. And I'll just skip ahead slightly here as she discusses the organisation of the communists as the counter-attacks approach, and they rely more on the population for help and similarly resorting to terror in order to facilitate that. Quote, The liberators again enter each house to seize young men and women as transporters. People are in a pandemonium, and rumours spread that the communist forces are establishing their headquarters at the Jia Joy School. In this area, the liberators' activities are more enthusiastic. Even though artillery intensifies, they still organise study and training sessions. In the citadel, where the royal palaces are located, the Liberation Army takes over completely. They wear armbands and take charge to scour for each house, looking for guilty people. Several are shot and fall in the middle of the road. Their corpses are left there. Nobody dares to go and bury them. There are corpses that have started to smell. Blood stagnates and dries up. Stenches spread, and swarms of flies mass around. It looks absolutely terrifying. The days began when Wei opened the door to hell. End quote. By the second week of February, the united forces of the Arvin, the South Vietnamese army, and the US had failed in retaking the citadel. And as we saw, even approaching that area meant that they would have to go house to house, clearing it block by block. Civilians like Nha Ka tried to find the vanishingly few safe havens around the city and would often find themselves staying in one place for a few days before having to move on amongst the chaos and fighting. The communists had been told that they would receive reinforcements and supplies as a new offensive would be launched on the 18th of February, but this did not occur. Very few of those liberators wanted to voice their concern that they may face a long and potentially losing battle against the encroaching counterattacks. The South Vietnamese president had told the Americans who had hesitated to use heavy artillery and airstrikes on enemy controlled areas that had a, you know, like significant temples and the palace. Well, he, I can quote him from Hastings' book where he said, These things were made by men. They can be rebuilt by men. Hit them. Hastings also says that, subsequently, shells and airstrikes pounded the citadel whenever persistent poor weather permitted. By the third week of February, after two weeks of intense combat, the Americans and South Vietnamese readied to take the areas around the citadel and eventually claim it, and the city, back. This was an imposing task with almost medieval difficulty, as this meant navigating the moat and traversing the bridges that led to this 200-year-old fortress. Like we're talking about a death rate of maybe five or so marines to advance maybe a couple of hundred metres. Eventually, by the 24th, Arvin soldiers were able to storm the most central strongholds of the citadel, replacing the communist flag that had flown atop it. And two days after that, the rest of the communist forces uh, were were pushed out of the rest of of the parts of the city uh, and and sort of cleared away, or or they retreated. They had lost perhaps 5,000 combatants, while Arvin losses were around 400, and the Americans had lost 216 in action. Both uh, those allies had suffered around 1,000 wounded or more. Perhaps up to 80% of the city had been more or less destroyed. And I'll share one journalist's description of what the former Vietnamese imperial capital looked like. Quote, 
Whole streets were laid waste. Rubble choked the sidewalk. There were bomb craters in the tarmac and the blackened shells of burned-out cars. A truck was embedded in a wall. The stench of the dead was overpowering. Between them, the communists and the US High Command have killed the flower of Vietnamese cities. End quote. If all of this destruction and death was not bad enough, those people who emerged from the rubble of their homes and their city were confronted by the fact that there were thousands of missing people. And as people searched, searched the streets, the buildings as they dug, they began to find the bodies. Before the fighting had even truly finished, as early as the 26th of February, the first of several mass graves was discovered. Over the last few weeks that the battle had raged on, there had been another reign of terror happening in the background. In the Jia Joy High School yard, having been cleared of enemy combatants as the Viet Cong and the NVA retreated, a hastily dug shallow grave was found, and it contained more than 170 bodies. On the outskirts of the city, on the sandy banks of the Perfume River, a platoon exploring the area, looking for weapons that might have been buried to be used by the enemy in the original offensive. Well, as they were looking, an American sergeant saw a strange shape jutting out of the sand. He thought it might have been a plant or root, and on investigation it turned out to be an elbow. As they dug, they realised that the first body they were uncovering was a woman, wearing a white blouse and black trousers, her hands tied behind her back, a bullet wound in the back of the head. A child was beside her, who had also been shot. In this mass grave, 123 bodies were found, including men, women and children. After a month, 18 additional grave sites had been uncovered. The number of civilian victims that were found in these graves had risen to 1,000. Douglas Pike, a historian of the Vietnam War who wrote extensively on Way, provides descriptions of these graves that suggest many of those killed had been buried alive, as they had their hands tied behind their backs, and contorted bodies but no evidence of wounds, many with sand or dirt filling their mouths. A year later, as the search continued, the count had risen to 2,000. By then, their relatives could only determine the identity of one of their missing family members by the clothes they were wearing. After that, the conditions deteriorated further, so that only bones and skulls would be able to be extracted. Some of the victims were not buried. In one instance, it is apparent that a few hundred people had been marked for re-education that had been taking shelter in a Catholic church. Eventually, they were marched some six kilometres to a creek where they were executed. The remains that were found there indicate perhaps some 400 victims. Pike suggests that this killing site, as well as other areas that were chosen for mass graves, indicates that many, if not most, of the victims were not killed prominently as a means of setting an example, meaning they, this wasn't killing some worthy traitor or American sympathiser in front of a crowd, but rather thoughtfully killing groups of people in areas where, in fact, the bodies may never be found and their murder was kept secret. While there are some suggestions that not all of those exhumed from these mass graves were victims of what is known as the Hue Massacres, most historians still point to the official figure that was eventually reached, 2,800 people, as being accurate, although the number has been suggested to be higher, as perhaps some graves simply went undiscovered. An Australian military advisor, Captain Dennis Campbell, wrote that, quote, One can understand the hate that lets the communists strangle military types with wire and decorate the walls with their bodies. But to bury alive whole families, including the children, on no stronger pretext that they refuse to take up arms, defies the imagination. I've always had a grudging admiration for the Viet Cong, but that has now gone. End quote. If nothing else, these killings undermine the suggestion that the Viet Cong held a kind of ethical or moral high ground over the Saigon regime. So what had happened in the four weeks that Wei had been under communist control? How did these killings occur? 
To kill at least, you know, around 3,000 people takes time, effort and energy and cannot be dismissed as some inevitable consequence of the other fighting. Douglas Pike suggests three phases that occurred over that four-week period, with each explaining a change of plans as a result of the evolving military situation in Wei, therefore having an impact on the planning and nature of the death orders that were issued and carried out. The first phase, in the first couple of days, relates to what was described in Yarkar's memoir. The corresponding military situation with this phase was that the communists had not really expected to be in the city for more than a week or so. So it was a, you know, a quick get in there, do what we have to do, kill off almost a whole government structure in the city as we saw them do in Saigon. So when we have to retreat, if we have to retreat, the impact on that administration is going to be huge. And this sort of goes along with the wider plans of Tet, right? Well, Douglas Pike describes this phase in detail, quote, During the supposed brief stay in Wei, the civilian cadres, accompanied by execution squads, were to round up and execute key individuals whose elimination would greatly weaken the government's administrative apparatus following the communist withdrawal. This was the blacklist period, the time of the drumhead court. Cadre with lists of names and addresses on clipboards appeared and called into kangaroo court various enemies of the revolution. Their trials were public, usually in the courtyard of a temporary communist headquarters. They lasted about 10 minutes each, and there are no known not guilty verdicts. Punishment, invariably execution, was meted out immediately. Bodies were either hastily buried or turned over to relatives. End quote. Pike considers this as similar policies as what had been going on in the villages of South Vietnam for a decade or so by this point, and as we discussed in the early episodes um, when we talked about the initial parts of the Vietnam War, basically it was this process by which communists would gradually take over a village and replace the administration of it. But in this case, obviously it was being done very quickly. In this phase, the targets were generally civil servants, people tangentially related to security or police work, as well as military officers, some community leaders like educators or religious figures. Now, Pike mentions that not everyone on the list was successfully found and killed, many were able to escape the city, but that after just a few days, this first phase of the killings was transformed, it shifted into phase two because of the changing nature of the ongoing battle for Huey. He says that in this phase, because it was a little bit unexpected, but essentially came about as the communists realized that they could hold the city, and they were actually looking at an extended stay. Pike calls this the social reconstruction phase, where the old social order was to be purged and efforts made to build a new one. Now all the social negatives and imperialist lackeys were going to be killed. Messages intercepted from as early as the third and fourth day of Tet indicate a realisation on behalf of Hanoi that shows there was belief that Wei was now going to be in the hands of the communists, and they acted accordingly. I'll quote Pike again here, quote, Among their acts was to extend the death order and launch what was, in effect, a period of social reconstruction, communist style. Orders went out, apparently from the provincial level of the party, to round up what one prisoner termed social negatives. That is, those individuals or members of groups who represented potential danger or liability in the new social order. This was quite impersonal, not a blacklist of names, but a blacklist of titles and positions held in the old society, directed not against people as such, but against social units, end quote. What makes this rather different from the initial phase of killings is that it was not done primarily to set an example, to punish traitors. Most of these killings were done secretly, with a lot of energy spent on hiding the bodies. It's very probable that the relatively few Viet Cong cadre who were familiar with the city and its inhabitants were mostly responsible for carrying out these killings, and would often involve entire families being murdered. 
Pike describes one well-documented case that illustrates this, and it is rather grim, so uh, a warning about that, but, quote, A squad with a death order entered the home of a prominent community leader and shot him, his wife, his married son, and daughter-in-law, his young unmarried daughter, a male and female servant, and their baby. The family cat was strangled, the family dog was clubbed to death, the goldfish scooped out of the fishbowl and tossed on the floor. When the communists left, no life remained in the house. A social unit had been eliminated. End quote. Now, this phase also involved a serious attempt to eliminate much of the intellectual class of Wei. Now, perhaps half of the total number that will be uh, killed in these massacres over this time period is done in these two early phases. Now, the third phase of the killing occurred as the battle in Wei turned against the communists, and perhaps up to a week before the final assaults on the citadel that would see the revolutionary flag replaced by the South Vietnamese one, it had become apparent to the communists that the tide had turned. Pike suggests that it was in this week leading up to the final loss that the communists began to kill a large number of people in order to essentially eliminate witnesses. This was probably when most of the killing took place, and if we think back to some of Nya Ka's descriptions of what was happening, like the people who you just assumed were a blacksmith or a beggar, and you had no idea they were actually part of this communist network, well, basically all of those people uh, in participating in this uprising had revealed themselves. Now, what this means is that person could not go back underground if there were so many people who knew who they were. And Pike suggests that many of those who had been, you know, uh, decided that they would undergo political re-education may not have initially been slated for murder, but because they would have recognised the people, you know, taking them away, who were doing this re-education, well, all the names and faces would be familiar. Therefore, as Pike says, quote, as the end of the Battle of Wei approached, these people didn't just represent a positive danger, but a complete liability. Such undoubtedly was the case with the group taken from the church at Fukam, or of the 15 high school students whose bodies were found as part of the Fu Tu Salt Flat find. End quote. And again, it must be stressed that there were great efforts undertaken to hide these bodies and killing sites. Some groups of executed were marched out to very concealed areas um, in order to keep this secret. So as the Battle of Wei itself took so many lives, created so much destruction, well, this massacre of civilians now illustrated a war where the basic fact that both sides engaged in this were Vietnamese, well, perhaps that wouldn't be enough to stem the tide of mistrust and hatred. It didn't count for anything if thousands of people could be killed like this. It seemed that even now there's still not that much known about this, really. And there were, at the time, of course, people that doubted it had happened, dismissed it as propaganda, similar to what went on in Cambodia, where people wishing to express their solidarity with uh, the socialist movement therefore wished to minimise any potential smears on that program. Hanoi continues to this day to ignore this dark period of the Revolutionary War in the South. But in the rubble of Wei, as those mass graves began to be uncovered at the end of February 1968, we can say that the Tet Offensive was at an end, and both sides had been deeply affected. With tens of thousands of dead and casualties, Hanoi acknowledged a military defeat. Their official history conceded that the battlefield had temporarily turned in favour of the enemy, that their posture and strength was seriously weakened. There had been no general uprising, despite the hope that those first few hours might have given them. And in way, the standout for the communists, even there, their claims of a victory were only in the sense that it lasted much longer than they thought they would have. In many ways, the entire offensive had seriously weakened the communists' prospects for winning the war. 
Many operatives had come out of their hiding places for the first time and would be targeted as American and South Vietnamese forces regained their positions. Viet Cong units had borne the brunt of much of the fighting and therefore suffered greater casualties, meaning that the North Vietnamese army would take a larger role going forward. Now, this meant that they would have more control over the war, but it would also confirm suspicions for those living in the South that this was less a, you know, a native Southern effort to liberate the country and more an effort from the North to simply take over the South. In terms of the US military prospects, efforts were now taken to hunt down these battalions and squads of Northern and Viet Cong troops who were now retreating back into the rural areas and regrouping in the countryside. They were hoping to corner them and wipe them out. In Quang Nai province, US military intelligence was looking for the Viet Cong 48th Battalion. They were hunting them down. And it was suspected that they may be hiding in a place called Son Mai village, southwest of the Batangan Peninsula. Son Mai village will be better known as Mi Lai, and the events that transpire there will be covered in the next episode. But as we wrap this episode up, we need to address the other massive impact of the Tet Offensive. How this huge cost for the communist war effort had not achieved its primary aim, but would perhaps overperform on a totally different metric. Having been told by their military leaders and their government officials that the war in Vietnam was being won, the people living in America who saw the Tet Offensive, well, that message had been completely eroded. In the first month of 1968, prior to the Tet Offensive, there had been marginal increase in those who were not actively supporting the war, but there was still no real opposition to it. But after Tet, there was basically no more consideration of how the war would be won, but essentially how America would leave it. And partly responsible for that, as we've heard at various points in this episode, was the role that the media played in this process. While it probably goes way too far to claim that the US media somehow lost the war, they were perhaps culpable of exaggerating the communist gains in the first days of the offensive. But it was not just their reporting. It was the facts of what was happening that gave this impression. As we saw, the execution of the Viet Cong prisoner, the bloodied corpses littering the ground of the US embassy compound, the footage of the rubble of Wei and the number of Americans killed in combat. I think there was this subconscious realisation that there seemed to be no point to this that the communists were not nearly defeated as they had been told. Between the ad breaks, sat down for dinner, perhaps the American mind grappled with some of the questions of this war as it was shown to them on the nightly news. The most famous example of this is Walter Cronkite's special report. I don't think it's going too far to say that he was America's most trusted newsman, and his grim take on the war, having travelled to Vietnam to judge what was happening for himself, has often been pointed to as a kind of, well, taking the temperature of what was going on. While he never actually says that the Americans are losing, or that they can't win, he does diagnose the conflict as being mired in a stalemate, and that perhaps more troops, more firepower, more everything, might only produce more of the same. And it is what we will end this episode on. See you next time, everyone. Tonight, back in more familiar surroundings in New York, we'd like to sum up our findings in Vietnam, an analysis that must be speculative, personal, subjective. Who won and who lost in the great Tet Offensive against the cities? I'm not sure. The Viet Cong did not win by a knockout, but neither did we, and the referees of history may make it a draw. On the political front, past performance gives no confidence that the Vietnamese government can cope with its problems now compounded by the attack on the cities. It may not fall, it may hold on, but it probably won't show the dynamic qualities demanded of this young nation. Another standoff. We have been too often disappointed by the optimism of the American leaders, both in Vietnam and Washington, to have faith any longer in the silver linings they find in the darkest clouds. They may be right, that a noise winter spring offensive has been forced by the communist realization that they could not win the longer war of attrition 
and that the Communists hope that any success in the offensive will improve their position for eventual negotiations. It would improve their position, and it would also require our realization that we should have had all along, that any negotiations must be that, negotiations, not the dictation of peace terms. For it seems now more certain than ever that the bloody experience of Vietnam is to end in a stalemate. This summer's almost certain standoff will either end in real give and take negotiations or terrible escalation. And for every means we have to escalate, the enemy can match us. And that applies to invasion of the North, the use of nuclear weapons, or the mere commitment of 100 or 200 or 300,000 more American troops to the battle. And with each escalation, the world comes closer to the brink of cosmic disaster. To say that we are closer to victory today is to believe, in the face of the evidence, the optimists who have been wrong in the past. To suggest we are on the edge of defeat is to yield to unreasonable pessimism. To say that we are mired in stalemate seems the only realistic, if unsatisfactory, conclusion. On the off chance, the military and political analysts are right. In the next few months, we must test the enemy's intentions in case this is indeed his last big gasp before negotiations. But it is increasingly clear to this reporter that the only rational way out then will be to negotiate, not as victors, but as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy and did the best they could. This is Walter Cronkite. Good night.